where machines are built targeted at a specific application uh, in mind. The, mm-hmm. We don't know how well that will work yet, um, but this is what, what a lot of people are working towards. Um, so hopefully we may see something in the next in the next few years, but the big machines that can really tackle some of humanity's biggest uh, problems, which we're all really excited about, is still a while away. Okay, so that's a very interesting statement. So some of these challenges worldwide, global challenges that you're particularly interested in, what, what might they be? Give, give us an example. I think uh, you know, I'm personally very uh, excited about uh, the pharmaceutical space, drug development. Um, so it, it's, it's you know, already understood that uh, if we can get to the right size of quantum computer, that those machines will be able to help develop new, new drugs. Uh, and I think that's really exciting. Um, these machines are thought to help with uh, understanding global warming, for example, being able to simulate um, the, the, the system, the global system, weather systems better. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's, it really goes across different, different sectors, the financial sector, um, big data in general. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think that the sort of drug development space, I'm personally very, very excited about. But I think the key thing is that we haven't discovered all of the applications for quantum computers yet. Uh, we are maybe where, where conventional computers were in the, in the 50s, mm-hmm. um, you know, where people maybe could come up with a handful of applications and that's it. And look, look where we are right now. So I think with the tech developing, uh, with us being able to say that we have these machines that they're getting there, people are becoming increasingly uh, active in that space to to investigate new applications. And that's, that's really exciting to not even know yet what these machines will be able to do, even though we already know it, it would be amazing. That, that's really interesting because what we have seen so far is a lot of interest from the medical sector, as you rightly say, uh, in terms of research. But I think that's coupled with this whole issue that's being faced now where antibiotics are not being developed, research into phage uh, antibiotics is is going ahead, but it's very difficult, it's very expensive, it's very complex. So it sounds like the capabilities of quantum computing will certainly help in those areas, but we're also having conversations around uh, logistics planning uh, and certainly from the financial services sector where a lot of companies initially were looking at quantum from the point of view of security, mm. but are now looking at quantum from the point of view of we've got a ton of data that means something. We're just not very good at finding out what it means and how we uh, use that data to enhance our brand or whatever it might be. So it's strange that you, you pick up on those two. So I think that kind of neatly links into this misconception generally that you you buy into quantum computing you can throw everything else you've got away that's obviously not the case don't throw anything away just yet no that's right uh so i think currently we we you know see quantum computers being able to tackle specific problems that that commercial computers really can't can't deal with um at all but you wouldn't want to use your your quantum computer to make a powerpoint presentation or to do some some other rudimentary tasks. So uh, there will be many, many tasks out there that conventional computers are, are much better than quantum computers. Right. So do you see the future of quantum computing, computing being that classical computing and quantum computing work together in a symbiotic way? Yeah, I think so. the, the ultimate solution. Yeah, I think you, you would you would still use your, your desktop computer and uh, you'd want to tackle a you know, really difficult problems this could be routing, this could be some big data problem where you'd like to find patterns and then big data sets. And uh, the, the particular difficult algorithm that needs to be solved gets outsourced by the cloud, so a computer that, you know, does the, the, the hard work, sends it back to the, the classical machine and, and uh, does the rest of the processing. That's sort of co-processor idea. And yeah. I think that would be that. Best. You put it a lot better than I did, co-processing. I understand that. So. Is that, is that where you see quantum uh, computing will be available to commerce and industry in that you, you will sort of dial into quantum capability rather than have your own machine in the basement that's delivering these enormous probability calculations and so on? I think generally that, that's correct. That's, you know, making this resource available via the cloud makes a lot of sense. These mm-hmm. machines are generally very complex, big, and, and need technical staff to, to look after them. Um, I think depending on the size of the company or if it's a government institute, you may want to have one in your basement and you want to build up that capability. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally speaking, at the moment, I would, I would think that this is a resource that's available by the cloud. Absolutely. Okay. 
So we're also very aware there's there's a number of different strategies, a number of different research routes that people are taking with quantum computing. Could you give us just a few minutes on the route that you selected at the University of Sussex? Yeah, sure. Why? So th- th- there are a number of different ways to, to build a quantum computer, um, and uh, people are taking different different strategies. Uh, we at the University of Sussex um, use uh, trapped ions for, for our quantum systems. So a quantum computer, so in the name, needs something quantum. Um, so you need to find yourself a good quantum system that you can use to, to store information into the process information. And uh, we use individual charged atoms uh, as our quantum system. So we encode information inside those atoms and then process the information. Uh, lots of good reasons why we, why we do that. It is currently seen as, as one of the two leading technologies worldwide for quantum computing. Um, we like it a lot because um, it's, a, it's a very well isolated system. Um, quantum is very fragile, it's what we don't experience it. So you need to find yourself a quantum system that you can isolate in the environment very well. And we have that with trapped ions. Uh, trapped ions hold the world records in, in gate fidelities. So the success rates when you do um, the, the processing of information is very high. Mm-hmm. Um, and we particularly, uh, believe that we have a very good route to, to scaling these systems up. And that's, that's core to, to what we at Sussex do, what we do at Universal Quantum, is think about how to scale machines up to the system sizes required to really do something useful. We're not so interested in, in you know, machines with a handful of, of qubits per se. So we think about that engineering very, very critically, and this is where we believe that the trapped ions have a key advantage. Okay, so you, you've chosen that particular route, and uh, without giving any trade secrets away, where are you in terms of that path, that roadmap to a successful, commercially viable quantum computer? Sure. So, so have you have you picked the right route? I guess that. Yeah, we, we very much think so, and I think it's it's um, it's probably nicely illustrated by the fact that we have to spin our company right now to do this commercially. So, so we think we've we've done our homework academically. We have picked the right path. We've um, we've proven uh, prototypes, so to speak, um, of, of our technology. And now we feel it's right to, to move on to the commercial world to do the, the necessary engineering on, on a commercial standard uh, to really then start scaling. But th- th- there is a lot of work left to do. Yeah. But we must certainly think we have a very clear route forward. Okay, fantastic. Um, what are the limitations of quantum computing in layman's terms? What are the limitations though? It depends in, in, in what respect. Like I said, the, the, there are lots of things you wouldn't use a quantum computer for, um, mm-hmm. for you know, certain problems you may want to solve. Um, so it's, it's difficult to say, it depends what you have in mind exactly in terms of limitations. But one thing obviously is, and that is key to know, we don't know mm-hmm. exactly yet what the capabilities will be. And so many, we don't know what the limitations will be. What we do know is this can be pushed a lot further compared to what we know currently, what these machines will be able to do. And I think that's the key exciting bit that everything we know so far, I find already incredibly exciting. We know it would change the world, uh, mm. but I think understanding that there's so much more to, to uncover, just like with conventional computers in the 50s, 60s, you know, no one could have envisioned that we'd be where we are right now mm. with computing. Something similar with, with my opinion happen with quantum. And I think it's, it's really exciting to be part of that, to investigate where the limits really are. Okay. Because you do hear a lot of expressions like, for example, data is the new currency. Right. Uh, we hear that an awful lot. But um, we're, we're still of a view as a company that it's great having these data lakes and so on. But unless you are interpreting that data and using it in, in meaningful ways, it's just a lot more lines on a very large Excel spreadsheet, you could almost say. So... Part of what we feel with quantum computing is it's less definitive by classical computing, one plus one equals two, where the quantum computing, one plus one is a very high probability of being two. So we see quantum as being used far more for modeling and for predictions and testing hypothesis, et cetera. Would you, you agree with that? Yeah, I think, I think that's, that, would be, that would be fair. Um, and I think that that is one part of what quantum we you know should be should be good at. I think when we and, and that's one thing for the reviewers to also understand when we talk about big data, that is really something that quantum computers will be able to do down the line. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's it, there are the more near term um, applications we we think might come a bit earlier, especially in, in the sort of chemistry, pharmaceutical drug development area. You know, being able to simulate molecules, chemical reactions. 
um, it, it's too early to say right now, but it's, it's generally understood that the big data games is something that you really need big quantum computers for uh, to, to really make a big impact on it. So that sounds like it's more of a phase two. Yeah, I would, I would think so. You never know. Yeah. You never know. And I think that's the, the, the interesting thing for, for people who are thinking about getting involved in this field is mm -hmm. that because it is difficult to predict exactly what's around the corner mm -hmm. and how quickly that development will go, it makes sense to, to get ready for it, to, yeah. to understand it to the right level that you can understand what it means for your business. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just cautioning people to not get uh, too much into this hype game of thinking this is around the corner next year or something and you can solve your big data for it'll be a bit further down the line. Okay, so so on that topic, um, obviously with your new venture, which we wish you every success for, um, you must be talking to businesses, organizations. Sure. What sort of reaction are you getting from the commercial environment to the prospect of what you're going to be able to do? Yeah, I think people are in, in incredibly excited. Um, there's no doubt. I think um, we're, we're very much in a in an education phase where um, you know we, we try to make people understand what, what we're doing, what the time scales involved are. But I think for them to understand that we think we have a path to scaling up is, is hugely exciting because those people after a while do understand that is where the, the really big applications of quantum computing lie. Mm. Okay. And would you say there's a particular sector that is more interested in what you're doing than another? Is, is there a leader of the pack that's emerging? Good question. Um, I wouldn't say so. Okay. Um, I think you could go by by funding, and then obviously, you know, governments are, are highly interested in this. It's a, it's the sort of technology where every major country should probably have a sovereign capability, and uh, which means you can you can see this across the world that will make sure, um Governments are putting a lot of money into this, um, but I think on, on the on the commercial world, you know, banking, pharmaceuticals. Um, the aerospace industry being able to, you know, model aeroplanes better, for example, it it's, mm -hmm. goes across all the sectors, I would say. Yes, that, that's interesting because, again, that's one we have an aerospace client, and one of the things they've been looking at uh, with the quantum lens on mm -hmm. is about airflow properties. Right. So, yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. I'm going to move to a few questions if that's okay. okay sure. Sure. Yeah. We've got dozens and dozens of questions coming in, some of which are very Technical, I hope you're okay with that. Um, this is an interesting one. Will quantum computers break Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? Quite often you were you would probably find me say, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. I think Bitcoin is is, is an interesting one, and uh I, I'm I wouldn't call myself an expert in cryptography, but the the one thing with crypto, uh, so general quantum computers are, are thought to be very good at breaking codes. That's maybe the first thing to uh, to say now in, in crypto for Bitcoin, for example, um, because I think you change like you very quickly, you, quantum computers have to be very fast at breaking these codes that conventional computers right now can't really break. Uh, mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you start thinking about clock speeds for quantum computers. And I think we're a while away um, for, for those computers, not only to break these big um, codes. So I'll say encoding, for example, is, is a big one that people know quantum computers will be able to break. But I think also to do this quick enough that you can keep up with, I think, how, how these cryptocurrencies work mm. is a while away. Um, mm. But I don't want to say this, this will never happen. Um, could, but I think right now it's, it's uh, more while away than that. I think every banker that's listening in just fainted when you said that quantum computers can break RSA encryption. Well, I, they, okay, <laughs> they, they should faint most certainly. Now, I, I'd like them to, to faint to some extent, but the good news is that there are quantum safe protocols out there. And a lot of the work that we do is... is talk to the, the banks, for example, and just make them aware that quantum isn't just this dream thing in academia anymore. This stuff is really coming. Mm -hmm. So it's time to, to prepare yourself for that. Some of the uh, shelf life of, um, of data is, is so long that you, know, you store this, you forget about it, and mm -hmm. in, in 10 years' time, this machine may be there, and it may be sitting somewhere uh, in someone's um, basement where they might not tell you that that machine exists, which means you need to have... Uh, you know, strategies in place to, to protect yourself against that. Uh, so you know, RSA encoding is, is something that, that we know quantum computers will, will impact. So it's time to change your, your encryption if you're possible. Mm. Absolutely. So there are ways to, to save yourself. They don't have to faint completely. But it's interesting, isn't it? That again, even though it's a while away, it's still something that right now people can't ignore. 
right in exactly. terms of their future planning and strategy and so on. Thank yeah. you for that. Brilliant. Um, another question from one of our uh, audience. How different is programming for a quantum computer rather than for a traditional computer? Yeah, really good question. So a quantum computer also runs quantum algorithms, um, just like a commentary computer does, but they run quantum algorithms. And they are quite different uh, to, to the classical ones. Um, so a lot of the work that people are doing at the moment in the field is to abstract the, the quantum is away from this um, to you know get you to a point where you can run your Python code and there will be a couple of black box subroutine quantum subroutines that you just that you just enter and so you then have compilers that sit beneath that that translate this into particular quantum architecture quantum computer that you then like to use so this abstracting why it's really important uh, for us to engage more people into into working with this sort of technology so mm -hmm. I think down the line. You know, you don't have to become a quantum expert mm -hmm. to, to program in a quantum computer, but you need to be able to appreciate what these machines can do. You're going to have to think slightly differently to make use of the capabilities that quantum offers. But I think the big job for us is really to, to make it as simple as possible and, you know, allow you to use the tools that you, that you already yeah. know how to use. So it comes back to what you were saying earlier in that the most likely application for a commercial requirement is that we will plug into quantum computing to deliver, as you just put it, a black box solution right. that just spits an answer back into the application as we, we carry on with classical computing. Okay, great. Um, the other question, which is always a uh, subject to these quantum discussions, will we ever reach a point where you can miniaturize quantum circuitry uh, and, I don't know, put it in your watch or your iPhone or whatever it might be? Never say never. Um, <laughs> it's. I think you know quantum. Quantum in general and quantum computing is just it's just one of the, the the quantum technologies people are developing. Um, you know there, there are other quantum technologies that you will experience on a, in a smaller form factor. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, but quantum computers specifically, it is miniaturizing it is not necessarily the biggest uh, goal at the moment for us. You know mm -hmm. we, we just want to make it work. Uh, so we're not thinking about putting this into a watch um you know the, these machines at the moment that they fill entire laboratories um and i think if we want to get to this sort of millions of cubits they're only going to get bigger but you never know down the line perhaps. okay so let's grab another question here what is the most compelling problem that quantum computing can solve for you personally for me personally for you personally so that's the yes I mean, like I said, it's it's in the drug space. I think. Okay. Um, I think if we if we can do something that will get us a step closer to securing Alzheimer's, um, mm. you know, what more do I have to do with my life? You know, that, that's that's pretty cool. Um, but like I said, we're a while away from that. But the, the whole medical side interests me a lot. So I'm not going to leave that one because it, it's a very interesting area. How does the capability of quantum computing map onto? That challenge you just highlighted, i.e. seeing the end of Alzheimer's. I, I think, yeah, we have to be careful we don't go too far with that. I, understand but it, that. Yeah. I think in, in, in general, the, when you try to develop new drugs, you need to understand chemical reactions. You need to, you know, drug companies spend billions of pounds just doing tests and they put different things together, how that would behave. Mm -hmm. Now, quantum computers are, are very comfortable in that quantum space, uh, understanding quantum systems. Uh, you know, maybe understanding chemical reactions much better than, than conventional computers can do, or, you know, you having to randomly test things because you can't simulate it anymore on a conventional computer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we already know that quantum computers will play a big part there. So I think that that's how, that's really the, the route into, into the drug development space. So picking up on something you said there, why can't a classical computer um, model these Reactions and so on. What 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 is the it's, problem? It's it's too it's too complex. Uh, it, it's you know, we're starting to talk about um, you know higher dimensional systems, um, you know, the infinite dimensional systems, which conventional computers just don't don't like working in. You know the, the sort of you know in in data, the sort of vector space, the size of that vector space that we have, um, conventional computers don't don't deal with very very much. Whereas quantum computers love that. Yeah. It's just inherent in, in how quantum works. So I believe it was one of our famous scientists that said the greatest power in the universe is exponential. Exponentiality, I think it was Einstein right. or somebody. And okay. That's our understanding of quantum, is you're, is you're tackling mathematical problems that are just way beyond uh, classical computers. I think the expression you use is 
the vector. It's, yeah, it's so different. If you you know if if you think of you know having just billions of different options um, mm. that you know your calculation can take, a conventional computer one after the other has to has to go through those, and that takes time. And a quantum computer, the way one can maybe imagine it is that it can look at all of these different options simultaneously, mm. and, and that gives you quite a significant uh, speed up. Although I don't like the word speed up because it sounds like we're just making something twice as fast. It, it's a completely different paradigm. Yes, so it, it's it's that ability to in a way have knowledge over the whole system that you're trying to understand simultaneously gives you quite an advantage supposedly over the conventional computers. Mm. I've got to ask, how did you get into this in the first place? How did I get into this in the first place? It's it's um I did a physics degree, I also did a management degree um or business degree and then decided I'd like to do a PhD and that's really then how I got some exposure to to quantum. Um and then in, in my sort of academic uh, career made you know make some make some breakthroughs and at some point realized that there's actually a commercial um side to this as well which i'm interested in this screen hence you know now with a startup it's it's you know coming home again um so as soon as i saw that there was some commercial potential there as well to really have an impact on on society i got very very interested in that yeah um, in that way around so it's through the phd group okay interesting um, Again, coming at a, a total side issue here, um, as a technology company ourselves, we resell other people's um, products and services and uh, we try and deliver highly agnostic solutions to our clients and, and not insist that they go down a particular route and so on. Um, but as a result of that, we do a lot of research into different products and so on. And what we find is that about 90% of product capability is, is pure marketing. Um, and when you actually drill down to the capabilities of a lot of technologies, there are no silver bullets. Mm. There are just good, competent technologies that give you an accelerator. They move you forward in, in I wouldn't say big steps, you know, a continuous uh, spectrum of small steps is what we tend to see. But do you see the advent of quantum computing on a commercial scale as being a real step change to human capability when it comes to automation? I think, I mean, not just there is automation. I think if slash when we we have you know quantum computers of this size that can you know tap into the the potential that we all think it has, it's going to change the world on, on quite a level. And I think realistically, we're probably going to look back and it will be a machine of the century uh, that that many people around the world are trying to build right now. So I think this is going to be huge, yeah, no doubt about it. But it's also really really hard. Um, but because of the the upside, because of the potential that this technology has. It's absolutely worth trying. Okay. And um, what's your audience like for these things? Do you find that people are happy to listen to the story and, and what potentially you're going to bring uh, with your commercial venture? Do you find that people's ears are open? Or have they been shut by the hype of uh, what was the latest thing, the internet of things and, and so on? It, it all, I don't know, it creates a certain deafness in commercial environments. Yeah. No, I think it's it's I think people find quantum quite intriguing. Um, you know, it's 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 an area that is very difficult to understand. Um, but it comes with um, you know, really cool things like, you know, something being in two places at the same time. You know, it, it's something that intrigues people because they don't easily experience that in their day to day life. Uh, mm. and I think when we talk to people about what quantum computers may be able to do down the line, people do get very, very excited. Uh, not just in the in the commercial world, but but also uh, you know the general public. You know, I had an exhibition yeah. at the the science museum uh, that people you know got very excited about. Uh, so it's it's really across society that people are interested in this. Mm. Um, and I think it's we have a duty to not just talk to to industry about this, but also the general public, because we we all know this is coming. Um, yeah. and I think people deserve to know um, what's you know down the horizon. I think part of the difficulty, of course, is that. Going back to my use, which is a, a long time ago now, mm. when you when you looked at a machine, you could open up the cover of it and you could see the cogs and the levers and the springs moving, and yeah. you could kind of figure out what was going on and how it worked. But of course, now you open up a, a, a chip or a piece of a computer or whatever, and it's just a bunch of plastic components that are not moving. Right. And yet you still got to conceptualize that as a machine. I mean, that is an even more difficult leap when it comes to quantum computing, because even the, the, the way in which a quantum computer works is, is dependent on some very strange behaviors. I mean, how do you get that message across to people? 
Yeah, communicating quantum in general is, is, is a challenge. Um, it, it is not easy at all. Uh, no one can relate to it, right? Mm. We all don't experience these, these strange quantum effects uh, that, that you mentioned. So it's, it is difficult, um, but I think luckily we're at a point now where we can go a step beyond. We don't just need to excite people about quantum mechanics anymore. We can get them excited about technologies that can tell people about what they want to do. And realistically, that, that's maybe what, what a lot of people is interested in, to mm. know that maybe there will be a new truck at some point because of quantum. Um, mm. or better navigation systems because of new atomic clocks or better yeah. sensors that will, you know, help you in some shape or form. So it's, it's, it makes it a lot easier nowadays to, to kind of communicate quantum through the technologies that we're developing. So we've kind of moved to a point now where if we can dream up a use case, we just assume that technology will deliver it at some point and not worry about the cogs and levers and springs and switches. Yeah. 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 I, I think... Quite rightly so, people shouldn't necessarily worry about the, the, the mm. levers, etc. You know, they, they they can you know leave that to us in, in many ways to work out. But uh, I wouldn't go as far as someone just dreaming up an application uh, and we just deliver. Um, we're, we're not quite at that stage yet. But uh, but yeah, you don't have to worry about the technical details. That's true. Yeah. Uh, Sebastian, suffice to say, thank you very much indeed for coming along today and helping us out. Thank really you for having me. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian.